Hey, what's up everyone? Today, we're diving into the shocking stories of five notorious killers who, despite their heinous crimes, have somehow regained their freedom. These are the cases that left the world stunned and questioning our justice system, whether it's due to legal loopholes, good behavior, or other controversial reasons. These individuals are back on the streets. Let's explore the chilling details behind each of these cases and see how they managed to walk free. Gather round, all you seekers of the night. Welcome to Patrick Star Corner. Number five. Vince Lee. Vince Lee became infamous in 2008 when he brutally murdered a fellow passenger on a Greyhound bus in Canada. On July 30th, 2008, 22-year-old carnival worker Tim McLean was sleeping with his headphones on. When the passenger next to him, 40-year-old Vince Lee pulled out a large knife and began stabbing McLean in the chest and neck before completely decapitating. Lee showed off the victim's head to passengers who escaped the bus before dismembering the victim some more and even eating some of his head. And all of a sudden I heard a guy screaming, I turned around, and the guy sitting right next beside me was standing up and stabbing another guy with a big a Rambo knife, pretty much. It was a big survival knife like this in the throat, repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. Uh, told everybody to get off the bus, everybody started to get off the bus. Uh, the guy stepped, kill step, or still kept stabbing him, and stabbing him. Uh, everybody got off the bus, me and the trucker that had stopped, and the Greyhound driver uh, ran up to the door to, to maybe see if the, the guy was still alive or we could help or something like that. And when we all got up, we seen that the guy was cutting off the guy's head. Uh, he was cutting off the guy's head there, and he saw us. He, he came back to the front of the bus, told the driver to shut the door. Uh, he pressed the button and the door shut, but it didn't shut in time, and the guy was able to get his knife out and take a swipe at us, so we backed off the door, and uh, I ran around the back side of the bus, the bus driver took off, and then we both returned to the front to see what had happened, and he, he hadn't even gotten off the bus, the door was still open. Uh, we shut the bus door that time and shut it, uh, it was at that point that he came, started walking to the front of the bus, and he had a, the, the head in his hand, and he just looked at us like this, Lee was a diagnosed schizophrenic who was not taking his medication at the time of the incident. He claimed that voices from God told him that the victim was evil and about to execute him. Despite pleas for the death penalty, in 2009, Vince Lee was found not responsible for the crime due to insanity and was sent to a mental institution. In 2017, Vince Lee changed his name to William Baker and was allowed to live independently. William Baker has no restrictions on his life as a free man. No one even has to monitor his medication. Mental health activists have deemed his release as justice. This will be difficult uh, for him, as it is difficult for the victim's uh, families to see him released in this way. Uh, but in Canada, we do believe that um, that, that justice is served uh, here uh, proportionally, uh, and that people can and do recover from all kinds of mental illnesses. But one of the first responding officers to the crime took his own life due to PTSD from the incident. Other people on the bus that day also suffered PTSD. The victim's family said they were horrified by Lee's release. Number four, Charlene Gallego. Charlene, alongside her husband, Gerald Gallego, were nicknamed the Love Slave Killers. They raped and killed 10 women, most of whom were just teenagers. They were active killers in Sacramento, California between the years of 1978 and 1980. Gerald was given the death penalty, although he died of cancer before it could be carried out. Charlene was quietly released from prison in 2002 after serving 16 years in prison. Charlene gave her first and only interview in 2013, in which she painted herself as a victim of her husband rather than a partner in crime. She said she was proud of putting her husband on death row. She said she now devotes 100% of her life to charity and her 10 victims haunted her. She has terrible nightmares and constantly looks over her shoulder in fear someone will recognize her. Charlene currently lives in Sacramento, California under her maiden name, Williams. I see it every day. I always see it. It never goes away. What memory haunts you the most? 
There isn't one more than another. There is not one more than another. They're all horrible, horrible memories. Number three, Mary Bell. Mary Bell was only 10 years old when she strangled two toddler boys in 1968. Bell informed her victim that he had a sore throat, which she would massage before proceeding to strangle him. After serving 14 years, Mary Bell was released at age 23 and given a new name so that she could start a new life. Four years later, Mary Bell had a baby girl. In 2009, Mary Bell became a grandmother at age 51. Bell won a court order to have her and her daughter's identity sealed for life. Number two, Pedro Lopez. Pedro Lopez might not be a name you know, but he is the biggest serial killer on this list. Lopez was convicted of killing 110 girls in Peru, Colombia, and Ecuador. Lopez claims he actually killed over 300 little girls. Police also suspect him of hundreds of other killings. He began by searching for easy targets in towns in Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. Gente de raza indígena y humilde. They were poor indigenous people, street vendors. These were the types of little girls that he chose, the poorest kids who have lesser education. He never chose white people. Lopez was briefly captured by an Ayacuchoan indigenous tribe in south central Peru after attempting to abduct a nine year old girl. The Ayacuchoan stripped Lopez of his clothes and belongings and buried him in the sand. However, an American missionary convinced the tribe to release Lopez and turn him over to the police. The police did not detain Lopez, and he was instead expelled from the country. Lopez was finally arrested in 1980 after trying to abduct a nine-year-old girl from a market. He confessed to killing hundreds of girls in South American countries. He said he would sometimes dig up their remains and have tea parties with their remains. Lopez served only 15 years in jail and one year in a mental hospital, where he was released early for good behavior. Today, no one knows where Pedro Lopez is, if he is free or incarcerated, or if he is even alive. His fate remains a mystery. His mother believes he has managed to avoid being killed by the families of his victims. Up until now, I haven't felt it. When someone dies, you feel a shock, and I haven't felt anything. I believe in what our Lord says. When a person dies, it's revealed to others. So there was nothing revealed to me. Number one, Carla Homolka. Carla Homolka was half of Canada's infamous Ken and Barbie killers. Homolka helped her husband, Paul Bernardo, drug and rape her own sister, resulting in her accidental death as a drug overdose. Carla also helped her husband kidnap, rape, torture, and murder two Canadian schoolgirls, Leslie Mahaffey and Kristen French. Carla Homolka reached a plea bargain to testify against Paul Bernardo. This deal was made before videotapes surfaced showing Homolka to be much more involved in the crimes than originally thought. Carla Homolka was sentenced to 15 years in prison and was released in 2005 even though she was deemed to be at risk of another violent crime. She now lives in a small town in Quebec under an assumed name with her husband and children. In 2018, Carla was found volunteering at her children's school. In prison, parents have opposed her presence outside schools, including her children's schools. Last year, there was a backlash in Chateauguay, and now she's facing resistance in Montreal's NDG district. Can I talk to you for a second? No, you can't. Since September, Homolka has been a regular fixture at Greaves Adventist Academy, a private Christian school. We don't want her there. We don't want her in the school. Lily is a concerned parent at the NDG school. She doesn't want her face shown. She says Homolka does more than just drop off and pick up her kids. She claims Homolka occasionally volunteers at the school. Several sources connected with the school say that on March 22nd, Homolka helped supervise a group of kindergarten students during a field trip to the Montreal Science Center. How would you feel knowing that your child is interacting with a, with a person who's a serial killer? Thank you for watching this deep dive into the lives of five dangerous killers who, despite their heinous crimes, are now free. It's unsettling to think about the justice system and how it can sometimes lead to outcomes that challenge our sense of safety. If you found this video thought-provoking, 
don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more content like this. And let me know in the comments what you think about these cases. Do you believe justice was truly served? Until next time, stay safe and stay curious. In the darkness, where secrets hide, there's a corner where the truth resides. Gather round, all your secrets of the night. Welcome to Patrick's Dark Corner, where things come to light. Patrick's Dark Corner, uncovering the mystery, striving deep into the dark.